This is David Crosby at Virginia State University. I apologize for the Zoom link. Uh, we are Zooming all over the place, and sometimes the links don't follow us. And uh, I apologize for not having the right uh, link for, for many of you today. Uh, I've been getting several emails, and I've been sending them uh, out as soon as I get them. Today is, sh is going to be a very exciting program, in my opinion. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about solar applications uh, for uh, backyard aquaponics. And, and everybody's looking at some way of trying to do, uh, get off the grid, try to reduce the, the uh, power outage uh, usage uh, for backyards. Uh, it makes no sense to have to run a electrical cord from your house to your greenhouse or to other things out there. But using solar power is probably the ideal way of operating a backyard, uh, hydroponic, aquaponics, or anything in your backyard that's has a garden to it. Uh, today we got three great uh, uh, speakers involved here. Uh, John Ignace is going to start off the the uh, presentations. Then we're going to turn it over to Crystal uh, Gala uh, no, Paulus, and at the at the very last is going to be Bob Lane. So we got three great presentations uh, to start, and I'm going to turn it over to John. John, if you want to get started, that would be great. Great. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Dr. Crosby, uh, and our invitation here to uh, present a brief webinar on some considerations for solar energy applications in backyard aquaponic systems. If everything's working right, my uh, screen is being broadcast, and you're seeing some slides. Uh, no, we're, we're not seeing anything yet. Oh, no. All right, let's see what's going on. Yeah. Uh, it was there a moment ago. Okay, very good. How about now? Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. Sounds like it's going through. Sorry about that. You know, Zoom always keeps things interesting. But uh, anyhow, thank you for the invitation uh, for us to present here. Uh, the outline for today's session is energy management strategies. Uh, then we'll go to a sample system load analysis, uh, highlight some different solar energy conversion technologies, briefly talk about system sizing and siding considerations. And then uh, because it's a brief introductory informational webinar, I uh, will share some links to additional resources for more information related to solar energy, uh, some incentive programs, and different energy management uh, tools. This is a pyramid of energy strategy management period. We'll kind of weave into different parts of the presentation here. Uh, you'll see this graphic is actually from NC State University, but you'll see the same strategy used in a variety of energy related programming. Uh, basically, the foundation of the pyramid is assessment to understand how you currently use energy to get a better understanding of your current energy usage. Then look for opportunities for conservation. Uh, from there, look for opportunities for efficiency improvements. And then at the top of that pyramid, look for opportunities for alternative energy. And as you can see towards the top of that pyramid, uh, as you go up that pyramid, things increase in complexity and cost. So basically, let's do the things that are less complex and less costly first uh, before we start getting into alternative energy. And then when we do get into alternative energy, that system will be powering the most efficient uh, uh, system that we, that we can design, that makes sense to design. Briefly, and we'll go into this a little bit more detail later in the presentation, but uh, two main types of solar energy. Uh, photovoltaic uh, PV uh, modules or panels uh, which generate electricity and then solar hot water or solar thermal collectors which make hot water. We'll talk more specifically about PV uh, later on. Now let's look at some examples of assessing uh, how you currently use energy. Again that bottom part of that pyramid there, understanding your current energy usage. With 
one example is from uh, Christos is going to highlight some of the thermal energy needs in a greenhouse and some considerations uh, in thermal energy management in a greenhouse. So with that, Christos, uh, you can begin your presentation and I'll advance your slides. Of course. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Christos Galanopoulos. Everybody calls me Chris for short. Uh, um, I'm currently um, entering uh, my graduate program at Virginia Polytechnic, and I believe that I should have, in this whole thing, I have a brief intro slide of myself. So, yes, thank you. And um, yes, and um, but my um, background is uh, in good old Virginia State University. I'm an alumnus there. Um, I, I believe I did my plant and soil science degree. I graduated in 2016 and I also got my dietetic, uh, my dietetic certificate. And also I work on the ICTAS project as well, which is the Institute for Critical Technology and Applied Sciences. Um, next, please. Um, but, first, um, but first, let's talk about energy. As we all know in the field of agriculture, energy is probably one of, if not the most critical parts of the operation. Um, however, um, and especially in the greenhouse or high tunnel operations, um, what is it? Energy is of high importance. And, um, and in our case, it's pretty much um, heating in order to maintain um, a proper equilibrium for our specialty crops. And I believe I have some literature here that says that in um, all these in these operation uses, it takes up to 65 to 85 percent of the total energy of the whole operation, which is, to put it very mildly, quite a lot. Um, most of the energy that we have nowadays tends to come from fossil fuels because that's been the standard for the past um, century or two. However, um, there are two things that that we must consider. Number one, fossil fuels, um, their prices can be influenced by both um, external polit geopolitical events. And also we're moving in a time and an era where there is, uh, where, where people are actively trying to move away from, the, from fossil fuel dependence. And this is especially true for a lot of the clientele in the field of agriculture when they're seeking to increase some um, their carbon footprint or in, no and not increase i apologize decrease their carbon footprint or their environmental impact so and then on top of that we have to deal with the volatility of fossil fuels in a in, in a business in the case of agriculture where you have very tight profit margins year by year so there is an impetus in um, producing your own energy and saving and um, heating and energy um production. And although we will go into um, alternative forms of energy, I'm going to mostly focus on um, utilizing the current existing energy producer may have. Next slide, please. Um, this is the energy action pyramid from the previous slides. Um, I'm going to mostly focus on two things, conservation, which I have, what, I have one of the arrows down here and also efficiency. So I'm looking more at the base um, part of this pyramid. Um, some of the stuff um, that you can do to, um, to more or less save energy is pretty self-explanatory, like turning off equipment that is not in use, unplugging, um, unplugging unnecessary things. And um, though not really so much related to energy, but I also do feel that uh, it needs to be mentioned Another form of utilizing what you have is um, using efficient water sources and irrigation that also cuts down on your water costs and also can um, affect your energy output. But the one that I really want to focus on is using, um, is, is using good insulation while simultaneously sealing any gaps or holes in the structure because I'm mostly interested in heat. So what we did um, is we set up a bit of a hypothetical trial in the Randolph Farms. Um, we decided, um, we created more or less two um, hypothetical greenhouses. Um, one of them is small and the parameters are, um, are listed there. I think it's 12 feet by length, 10 feet by width and seven feet by height. And the other one is large, which is 96 by 30 by seven. 
Um, we use, uh, we try to see um, various, we try to see the effect of various materials that a producer may have at hand. So you have your traditional single polyethylene um, with the highest heat exchange U value. This is a value that more or less uh, indicates, um, which more or less kind of indicates the rate on which heat is um, transferred from the inside to out, if I remember correctly. And the higher, and the, higher the value is, the less efficient the material is. So you have the single polyethylene, then we have the double inflated polyethylene, which is our midway. And then we have um, the Solex, which is probably, uh, which is uh, one of the most efficient ones that we had on, um, on our um, arsenal, hypothetical arsenal, of course. And then um, what we also like to examine is um, the structural condition and its effects on heat conservation we have more or less the ideal version, which is more or less, it's brand new, no holes, no gaps, just recently made and just airtight. Then you have, then um, we, did, we had the adequate, which, uh, which more or less states that there's a couple of holes or gaps, some mild wear and tear on the structure. And then you have like the worst or severe, which means that there's a lot of holes, there's a lot of gaps, there's a lot of openings. Um, for the internal temperature, we, um, we took it, we assumed it to be 70 degrees Fahrenheit, AKA um, the temperature which lettuce, uh, flowers and seeds. I know that for lettuce, you can produce in a lot lower temperatures, but um, I included that if we had it a bit on the higher side, we would have more visible results. And um, we also, and as, the tool of a and as the tool of calculation, we use the virtual grower program from the USDA ARS. The heating um, unit that we're using is British Thermal Units or BTU. And um, the method itself is um, via propane unit, which um, in said unit is um, within the three to five year range with an annual maintenance and schedule. So we're basically looking at a run of the mill, respectfully maintained, um, uh, what's it called? Fossil fuel um, heating mechanism. Uh, because as I said, we're, we're going to go into the alternative energies, but we're mostly focused on conservation now. And this is a bit of a um, snapshot of, um, the virtual, of the virtual grower tool. It's a free system from the USDA ARS. Um, we have the web link below. And what you can do is that um, in order for you to calculate your heat loads, your heat efficiencies, you can go through these various like um, tabs under the design section. You can set your location. You can set like um, your materials, you can set your parameters. Um, you can also set like the extent of the damage. Then you've, uh, then you've also got the heating, which is the one that um, is, is shown here. And then you can calculate your outputs and it, can, and it actually generates a very nice uh, Microsoft Word report. Um, yeah, that, this picture doesn't have much of anything to do. It's just more or less a cosmetic. So um, back to so the max BTU for the heating size, um, what we saw is that the bigger the structure size, aka volume, the, the larger the, BTA, the BTU output is. Um, the material that the greenhouse is made of plays probably the most crucial role in all of them um, in maintaining your heat. And then, although the condition of the structure also influences the energy consumption. So, can, so can, and here is um, a, bit, a brief, um, a brief plot that I, well, br uh, sorry, a brief bar plot of um, the outputs. This is the max BTU usage, which basically uh, is one of the features of um, the virtual tool. And it says like, how much is gonna, is your output under like worst, under like the lowest temperature scenario. So this one here is for the large, um, high tunnel or, or greenhouse, and this one's for the small one. And you can clearly see that um, the larger the structure, the more critical um, the material and the structural condition of, um, of, the, um, of the greenhouse, the more, the more critical the role, those roles are on conserving energy. And you can also see it on the small one, but because of the lesser volume, it becomes less apparent. Um, this one is also a brief um, a plot. I'm showing like the annual um, BTU 
BTU outputs on a monthly basis. We also have the large and the small. And you can clearly see that at the two extremes where the temperatures tend to be the lowest, um, the, uh, the, output, the, the expenditure get, gets to be really high. And what I would also like to show, especially in the large one, is that the um, Solix, which is the most efficient out of all of them, you see like a smaller expenditure rate. So you can clearly see the significance of um, the materials that you use in the long run in a BTU conservation. And um, here is the annual sum, which is based of um, the BTU um, outputs of both of the structures, the large and the small, which is basically um, the same one, at, which is basically just the added amount of BTU from the monthly one. I would like um, to show, I would like to show like a comparison of like the double poly, of like the double poly ideal versus um, the single poly worst. So we have for the single polyethylene, um, where is it? It's this polyethylene single there. We have about like four, about 460 <clears throat> million? Yes, about 460 million BTUs for per year. And then we see it with for the double poly, like about half of it. And we and you can see that just by changing um, the just by changing the material alone, along with um, and along with doing the minor um, the minor st the structural adjustments, you get you get to more or less save all this amount. And I cannot see the thing is right down there. And um, below that, you can also see the volume of the, um, what is it, the cost of, um, of the propane that you use as the heating unit and how much, which more or less adds in is just how some of these simple changes, even though the upstart costs may seem a lot, how much it saves you in the long run. Um, next slide, please. So what I would like to summarize is that the materials used as as the primary form of insulation probably plays the most crucial role in a, and as I like to quote, holding on to the heat of the greenhouse. And you see this with both the large and the small one with the Solix, which had the lowest U value, which yeah, even it had the lowest U value, but it also had like the lowest amount of um, BTU outputs. And the structural condition, while it doesn't seem to play such a crucial, um, such a crucial role. We got under. We got to remind ourselves that this is a business where um, the profit margins um, are very slim, and sometimes they can make you make it make you or break you. So I would like. So what I would like to get out of all of this brief um, experiment is that prior to examining alternative sources of energy and um, dealing with um, the complexities of adding in new um, technologies, please examine. Um, Please examine on ways to increase the efficiency of both your energy output and your energy conservation. And, and here is some of the sources that, uh, that I used for this. Um, some of the works cited and also some of the links. Um, and here is also a brief YouTube video that um, John was more or less, was um, very glad to um, share with me. Um, do you, John, do you think we should go into it or should we just leave it as a link? Uh, Christos, thank you very much for that presentation. I, I think the, um, we'll just highlight some of the references that folks can often access after the webinar. Of course. Uh, so thank you for sharing those, those links, uh, that video link. Uh, and again, thank you for, for showing the example uh, of using virtual grower as a tool to kind of do some what if analysis and explore potential energy uh, cost savings uh, through different design choices on even maintenance issues, you know, even sealing up a, a greenhouse, uh, some of the Indeed. potential savings for that. Uh, so if you're considering folks out there, maybe a solar hot water, solar thermal uh, system, uh, to help uh, heat uh, part of your greenhouse, part of your aquaponic system. Uh, I think 
Krista's uh, slides here shows some of the opportunities with first taking a look at some of the energy uh, efficiency improvement opportunities because those those BTUs need to come from somewhere uh, and whatever size system solar system you have will offset that much more of say your propane or electrical energy usage uh, based on uh, you know, the more efficient you can make it. So Christos, thank you very much. Uh, next up is uh, Bob Lane. Bob Lane, an extension specialist from Virginia Seafood ARAC in Hampton Roads with Biological Systems Engineering. Uh, Bob? Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Can I have the next slide, please? And we were given some hypothetical examples of uh, some greenhouses. So I wanted to sort of focus in on the eight by 12 and the 30 by 30 by 96. And we want to look at some of the things you are putting into your greenhouse and assess what is it that your energy use will be? Uh, will it be, where, where is it going to be? Whether you use uh, hydroponics or vegetables or those areas. And next slide, please. Some of the, some of the examples of equipment for a small greenhouse would be a water pump, recirculation pump, uh, transfer pump, air pumps. And those, those are all looking at the aquaculture side, uh, making sure that the water pump is, is being used to transfer, uh, transfer water from your tank to your, to your system or your recirculating pump, which is crucial to your, uh, your aquaculture system. Air pump, of course, you want to maintain an air pump. So mostly the recirculation pump and the air pump are going to be going 24 hours a day. Transfer pump, not, off, not as much, but you're going to be transferring some water, adding some water on a daily basis. Um, in the wintertime, we're looking at immersion heaters, uh, making sure your temperature will be uh, at the right temperature. So depending upon how many uh, what the temperature is outside, how many immersion heaters and the size of your, of your water tanks. Lighting, uh, uh, again, conservation-wise, we're looking at LED plus at nighttime or uh, some other area where you need lighting. Uh, so those, those are more efficient lighting that you have. If, you're, if you have some compute controls, which would control the, uh, the use of solar applications or, or controlling the uh, computer opening and shutting of the fans. Uh, sometimes you just have it on a thermostat, but sometimes you have a computer control depending upon the size of the facility. I added scales. Scales are something you might weigh your product on and you might use that in your greenhouse. And grow lights, uh, depending upon what, what you're looking for. And then I did a, a circulation fan and we wanted to know, well, how do we move air through from the outside to the greenhouse uh, during, during different times of the year? Also, I, I didn't see in here, but I wanted to add, a, if you look at some heating applications, you may want to use an electric heater or a gas heater. But this is the difference of what you're seeing here, this side on the eight by 12 or the, or the 30 by 90. So these are just some examples that I tried to show a difference in, in they are uh, to say, okay, this what you have in a large greenhouse or in a small greenhouse. And you may have the same equipment or different equipment in your facility. Next slide, please. So this is the example of what is the power rating or what is the actual uh, wattage rating on the different items that you have in the greenhouse. Again, uh, if you look at the second column, you'll see it says power rating. So the recirculating pumps 400 amps, the transfer pump is 345. And down, the, down that column, you'll see well, what, are, what is the wattage rating for each one of these uh, based on 115 volts and the amperage that was given. And um, if you look it up in a catalog, you can see what those temperatures are. For example, a, a recirculating pump might be your friendly, as some people would know as a tiny giant pump. That's a, naming a name brand, but there's other, other brands out there as well. So what I'm trying to show is how often do you use this machinery or this equipment in your facility? So in that listing, you're going to have an operating time. Um, and so th for this, for example, in the, in the uh, operating time, I said the recirculation pump would be 24 hours per day, a 
a transfer pump, maybe two. Air pump again, 24 hours per day because you want to make sure if you're if you're having fish that you're getting the proper amount of air. Uh, immersion heaters are on, but only in the winter. But when they're when they're used, maybe as much as eight hours a day. Uh, lighting, if you're using it at night and you're uh, having a 24 hour, you want to go out and provide something for your um, aquaculture for hydroponic facility at night, then it'd be 12, 12 hours a day in, in the worst cases. Um, that would be depending upon the sunlight. Computer controller, again, maybe 16 hours per day. Scales, if you're going to weigh products or, or fish or, or other things, then one, one hour per day. Grow lights, again, it may vary from what you have, but uh, I, I put in eight hours and then circulation fan, maybe eight hours, maybe more to, to, to re replace the outside air in your, in your facility. Well, what we did here, we wanted to find out the total energy consumption based on what the kilowatt or the watt hours per day was. So we multiplied the, the power rating, which was the watts, times the operating time, and then we got the energy consumption per day. So for our, in our small greenhouse with this equipment, an example would be roughly 100, 101,196 kilowatt or watt hours. Uh, so that watt hours, why we're doing that is because we wanna see well, how many watt hours are needed in order to develop a uh, relationship with the with a solar output, if you if you go down to your and looking at a solar package, you may see that it's buried in 100 watts. So um, right away, he would look at our power rating, and you'd see that one of the things that we have is the recirculating pump, and that's 400 watts. So if you have a, a 200 watt or 100 watt panel, then you would know you multiply the number of panels times four to get 400 so you need four 100 watt panels but that's that's just the beginning so what i'm trying to show here is through the watts you would have a number of different pieces of equipment you put on but you also have to know how many panels represents the total wattage that you need so you're going to have to make some decisions in the model and next slide please Next slide, please. What, what is critical for my greenhouse operation when there is little or no sun if we're only looking at a, a solar application? So you may not wanna cut all the wires to your process or your greenhouse, but you wanna say, well, where can I put solar applications? Where do I wanna look at it? critical operations such as a pump, which pumps water, when there may be little or no sun? Or do I want to look at a lighting operation uh, where I need task lighting during the day or some, something that says, okay, I can use solar and it's going gonna, it's gonna to allow me the necessary uh, lighting to, or energy to use for my operation. Previous slide, please. And again, we're looking at what what can we what can we do or what can we use based on the size of our greenhouse. What can we use? And we start out with the smaller things or the critical things. So, I identified in in this um, the large in the large greenhouse the recirculation pump is fairly critical if you're looking at a uh, water uh, aqua, aqua hydroponic or, or aquaculture facility. If you're looking at a hydroponic facility, you may not need recirculating pump as, as often. A transfer pump, the same way. An air pump as well. Immersion heaters, again, only during the off-peak time, but in the winter time when you might need those immersion heaters, it could be cloudy. So we may not want to add all those on. Uh, lighting might be the task, like computer controls or scales, that might be something you could use. So when you're looking at equipment and you're looking at what's critical about your equipment in relationship to your uh, operation 
what do you need first and what do you need the most and then what does it cost next slide please next slide please so so one of the things that john john had had is we'll be looking at will be the grid interactive with battery backup and or off the grid so basically it says are you plugged into your electrical company's grid and do you have battery backup with that grid to begin with um, if not so when the grid goes down you have the battery you have the battery backup necessary to run your critical operations off grid same question do you have the energy necessary to if you're going to go off grid and com completely remove yourself from the power grid what is it that you'll need in order to provide yourself with power to run your your operations if you're a grid with an interactive with battery and uh, backup that's a hybrid application and you can have a standalone power system that hybrid application is allows you the, the convenience and the, the uh, response for your ability to maintain your system operations without losing either the, the power for the necessary equipment during during your normal operations when you when you need backup next slide please so the other questions on loading is how big is your solar array if you need 100 watts or you have a 100 watt system will that be necessary this the size you need for the uh for your application say if it's a motor or if it's a computer or if it's a a electric heating system so maybe you need to think about how many solar panels you have if you're using a battery backup then what's charging the battery as well as what is is running your operation during normal times when you are using the grid or using solar and then how efficient is your system uh, from the standpoint of getting the total amount of light that's that's available how is it uh, and then be making that light available and transferring that into electricity and then your financial options as as you remember in the triangle the more the more technology or that you have and the more things that you have on solar the higher the cost may be so you have to weigh those options see what your facility is looking like as far as the cost now and then what is your financial obligation if you make those changes to better yourself but at the same time are you are you seeing a return on those of those investments in solar next slide please and then this is the last page opportunities for efficiency and how might these efficiencies uh, these choices affect your solar system um, this is a, a load analysis similar to what I showed in the electrical system for the uh, for the greenhouses but again similar to your house what is it that you're looking for for the efficiencies first I appreciate your time this morning and I'll turn this back over to Dave, to John Ignash Bob hey thank you very much uh, so Christos gave uh, some insights for considerations into managing uh, the thermal load uh, for uh, the greenhouse. And then Bob there uh, gave some insights, considerations for managing the electrical load uh, for uh, an aquaponic system. So let's take a closer look at uh, some of the solar energy conversion technologies. We have uh, some recorded vid videos that go into the details of uh, photovoltaic uh, systems and also uh, solar hot water, among others. Uh, so what I thought I would do is go through these next few slides fairly quickly, but if there's certain area of interest uh, to you, uh, we have some links to additional resources or, or feel free to, to send me an email and we can get you uh, more information on the parts of this that you're uh, you're most interested in, uh, but wanted to give an overview of what some of the solar PV photovoltaic system components uh, look like, 
uh, how they can be uh, put together, uh, and how this all builds from your load analysis to figure out some system design options and considerations based on your goals. So what is PV? PV is a semiconductor material that produces electricity when exposed to light. There are a variety of uh, PV semiconductor uh, materials out there. Uh, since you know, 1975 to present, uh, here's a graph showing the variety of different types of uh, photovoltaic materials that are out there for different applications. Uh, some of the higher efficiencies uh, are for space applications. But basically what they have in common is there's a solar cell, which multiple cells put together are called a module, what we most, most people call a solar panel. And then when a bunch of modules or panels are put together, it's called an array. So a solar array is, uh, is multiple uh, solar panels or solar modules put together. They produce DC electricity when exposed to light. They last 20, 30 years and have no moving parts. Basically, there, there's, there's really three types of, of these solar PV panels, although made from different materials, but the most common for, for kind of commercial applications are monocrystalline or polycrystalline silicone. And then there's also thin film. Uh, but what you tend to see uh, in applications are either the monocrystalline or the polycrystalline silicon uh, panels. Some images about the wiring of these, how these solar cells are put together in a solar module uh, with junction boxes on the back of the module and then how the wires actually uh, interconnect, uh, what the MC4, those connections are called, uh, connections. Now looking at different ways these things might be put together, uh, we have a few slides because there's a variety of different options. Here are uh, what we call a utility interactive. It's often referred to as a net metered system where we have the PV panels and an inverter to convert or to invert that DC uh, to AC power and then to connect to the electrical grid. You'll notice that there's no energy storage, no batteries uh, in this system. And then this is called net meter because it feeds back into the electrical grid and offsets your, your consumption over the course of a year, typically. Now, different options on where we invert that DC to AC power. Uh, sometimes it can be done here where you see a, um, a string inverter uh, or here where we have microinverters or they're mounted actually on the back of each panel, on the back of each PV module, and inverts the DC out of the panel to AC, and then connects to a junction box to the service panel, and again, a net metered system. Another uh, item you might hear of are called DC optimizers. Um, micro inverters, picture in this slide, and DC optimizers, have an added benefit where if you have a string inverter uh, and you have any shading on any part of that array, that whole, the output from that entire array is going to suffer because of shading, even on a small corner of a far panel. Whereas if you have microinverters or DC optimizers, you could have partial shading on a panel in an array, but it won't affect the overall, it won't bring down uh, the overall production of the um, of the entire array, the, the 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 shading on the panel that's affected will go down because of that shading, but it won't impact uh, all of the other modules in the array. So these types of, of components, DC optimizers and, and microinverters, uh, can have added benefits based on certain challenges any uh, any site location might might pose. So that's what a DC optimizer is and does. Uh, and same type of thing, where in this case, we still have DC power, uh, then it goes through an inverter to AC, and then it's a net meter grid connected or grid interactive, utility interactive system. Now, here's an example of uh, energy storage uh, through a battery bank and also utility uh, it, connection. So grid interactive system with energy storage. Uh, so similarly, we have the PV system, we have the inverter, which also has a charge controller. And what will happen is 
between the electrical grid and the output from the PV system, it'll keep those batteries topped off. But when the grid goes down, you have on-site energy storage in that battery bank to service, say, an emergency circuit load uh, and, uh, and be able to have power uh, while the grid's down. I should stop here just briefly. A common misconception is if you have solar PV panels uh, on your, you know, on your, on your rooftop, uh, you're okay for when the power goes out. If you, if you have this system, which is the utility interactive PV system without any energy storage on site, what that string inverter will do is when the grid goes down, that inverter is looking for a frequency signal from the grid and it'll isolate the PV system once the grid's down and it no longer sees that signal. And that's to prevent hurting the line workers that are working on the, the electrical grid and back feeding uh, the, the grid. Uh, so without energy storage, you're not going to have power uh, with, uh, with that when, the, when the grid goes down. Uh, so it really depends on how things are put together and how th things are put together are based on what your specific objectives are. So on-site energy storage and some type of battery bank is essential for having uh, power uh, when the electrical grid goes down. Now, of course, you can have uh, be entirely off the grid, so no connection at all with the grid. Uh, so we have some similar components here, but there's nothing connecting to the grid in this case. We have the panels, uh, the inverter charge controller, and the uh, electrical panel box there to service AC loads uh, in the house, cabin, uh, greenhouse, whatever they might be. So similar setup, just no, connect, no final connection with the electrical grid. But these systems have big implications in um, uh, the size uh, if you're going to be entirely off the grid uh, and also your load analysis, like Bob pointed out, what we call how critical are certain loads and how much additional capacity do we need to build into the system for when there's a string of cloudy days. We'll talk more about that here briefly. Now this gets, remember that pyramid, as we go up the pyramid, uh, things go up in cost and complex. And this is probably on the, the tip top of that, uh, of that energy pyramid, where we have, here's an example, this is actually in Virginia. Uh, this is an example of a system here that has kind of a hybrid standalone power system. So he, this, this person is entirely off the grid on a hilltop somewhere. Uh, and they have uh, generator power, they have solar photovoltaics, uh, they have a wind turbine, and actually in the front there you can see those are solar uh, uh, thermal collectors, so they have a solar hot water system as well. Uh, so all of these things are designed uh, to work together to meet the thermal and electrical load, or to try to meet the thermal and electrical load of that, of that residence there you see in the top right picture but highly expensive and highly complex. More about PV inverters. Again, these convert the DC electricity that the panels generate uh, to the AC electricity that we use in our houses. Uh, synchronized with grid electricity, uh, like I mentioned about for the string inverters, only operate when the grid is up in that example that I gave and tend to have an approximate life of, uh, you know, between 10 to 20 years, depending on, on the component. I think most microinverters have a warranty now of around 15 years and then string inverters a, a bit longer. And here we talked about partial shading, uh, different orientations, mismatched modules. The behavior and the output of these systems would, will vary if one is using a string inverter versus if one is using DC optimizers or a microinverter. Uh, so any partial shading on array will negatively impact the whole array if it's a string inverter, uh, whereas microinverters and DC optimizers are a bit more robust because that, that inversion is happening uh, from DC to AC on the, back of the, um, on the back of each module. So these technologies, these um, components give uh, some flexibility in the design of, um, of certain systems based on, you know, site uh, constraints 
uh, in, in certain applications. So things to keep in mind as you're, as you're considering what, what something like this might look at a, for an application of interest to you. Now, energy storage, this has uh, been a, a fast growing, changing market. Predominantly, these had been flooded lead acid uh, batteries, also some valve regulated lead acid batteries. And emerging though fast are lithium ion uh, batteries whose costs have come down uh, uh, quite a bit. So some type of energy storage. And Bob brought these points up, but you know, when we look at all these things, but how big of a solar array and how big of a battery bank? Well, it depends on a lot of things. We talk about this energy action, action pyramid for a energy management strategy. And Bob highlighted these examples in his, his uh, the electrical load analysis. So it all is a function of what is the electrical load that you need to meet and what is the duration that you need to meet it. Other factors. Load analysis, how much energy is needed and when. Uh, the solar resource, how much sun do you have to work with? Site and system factors, what's the efficiency of the panels, the inverter, uh, these types of things. Less efficient system is gonna require bigger components, more panels. Uh, is it a ground mount or a roof mount? What's the orientation of the panels? What is the angle, what is the tilt of the panels? Or is there shading uh, on the array or soiling and a little, even a little bit of dust can negatively impact the output uh, of these systems. And of course, we always have to keep in mind Murphy's Law uh, where things go wrong, right? And we have strings of cloudy days, we have a rainy season, things like that, that can affect uh, the output uh, and the additional energy storage we might need to, um, to anticipate having on site. So criticality of certain loads, uh, Bob talked about this a bit, you know, a simple example here is, you know, ceiling fan versus something that's a vaccine refrigerator. So think of that in the context of an aquaculture system. There's things that are more important. Uh, certain system components are, are, are very, you know, more important than others. Uh, and we want to be able to meet in the design any of the most important uh, critical loads. So certain aeration pumps, things like that, that just need to be running all the time, otherwise there's uh, uh, dire consequences. We want to make sure that the load analysis uh, specifies that uh, in the assessment. And this word autonomy, basically all this means is how long can you run with no uh, solar input uh, into, uh, into the system? So you have uh, cloudy weather uh, for a number of days, big rainstorm, but you need to meet that load. How long can you do that? If you can do it for two days, your system has two days of autonomy. If you can do it for half a day, well, it's only half a day of autonomy, which isn't much. But to have some uh, safety factor there to be able to run even when the panels aren't, uh, aren't uh, helping to charge the, the batteries. And all these things are management uh, considerations that really have dramatic impact in sizing the battery bank and also the size of the solar array. But assessing the solar resource, there's this term called the solar window. And basically, if you can picture the path of the sun every day over the course of a year, that's what the solar window refers to for a specific site. And that is a, basically a function of, the, of latitude, where you're at on the face of the earth. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Solar panel tilt. You know, these, these panels can be tilted uh, at a certain angle to suit uh, the needs, to, to best suit the needs of the, um, based on the load analysis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, uh, because there's certain strategies to pick a certain tilt angle uh, based on trying to better match the, uh, the electrical load over the course of a year. Peak sun hours. Basically, this is a this is a, a term used in the solar industry and site assessment work to try to specify, you know, on average, what is the maximum sunshine on average for a given uh, month of the year for a location, and it's used in sizing uh, calculations. And more on that here in the next example. Here are some peak sun hours. Uh, for Lynchburg, Virginia. 
Uh, you can see on the far left, we have the tilt, which is just the angle that the PV panel is, uh, is, is, is angled at, is tilted at, from zero, perfectly flat, all the way to 90 degrees. Often you'll see a reference to tilting it equivalent to the latitude of the location. So Virginia, that would be about 37 degrees. And then you can see across those, the year from January to December, and then on average, the far right column for the year, what impact that has on the peak sun hours. So if you have a load that is primarily a summer load, for example, well, perhaps you want to have it, the tilt of the panels uh, set to maximize solar harvest uh, during those, those summer months. Uh, and that angle would be a little bit different because this, the sun's position over Virginia at that time of year is different than it is, uh, say, in the winter time. And you can see those values, say, from April to October, how those change across those, uh, those tilt angles. But if your load's the same over the course of a year, uh, it has different implications. Now, those were lookup tables, but a great tool uh, that I'd encourage you, if you have interest in solar energy, I uh, encourage you to take a look at is a free tool uh, from U.S. Department of Energy, National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, uh, called PV Watts. There's the website for it. Uh, all you do is uh, zoom into your location, answer a few questions, and it helps you calculate those peak sun hours uh, for that location. Same values in this lookup table, but unique to your location. Uh, based on the, um, the responses to your question, if you specify a certain tilt angle, those kinds of things. Uh, so you can look at uh, the solar radiation peak sun hours uh, for this example is from uh, PV Watts. Another important issue is uh, the actual site analysis. So we want to avoid shade <laughs> with these solar panels uh, and shade can come from obvious places and places that are a little bit more maybe camouflaged again over that course of a year uh, where the the sun travels uh, so a neat tool to help do that instantaneously is called the solar pathfinder uh, which is basically just a has a fisheye lens on the top of it uh, and then if you remember this um, this peak excuse me, this, uh, this solar window where the sun travels over the course of a year, basically that same concept is on this, uh, this template. Uh, for location, uh, it shows over the course of the 12 months of the year, the solar locations uh, for that site. You put that template underneath this fisheye lens and you take a picture. And if you can see superimposed on top of that fisheye lens, is the shading uh, from trees at this example site. What we would then do is highlight uh, the area of the, of the solar window that is gonna be affected by shading. And then we make choices based on that, either to find a better site or find a way to minimize some of the shade. Um, but you'll see in the middle of this uh, solar pathfinder template, uh, between the kind of the 10 o'clock to about three o'clock, those core hours are very important to have near full sun. Otherwise, the uh, system is not going to perform as designed. So this would be a bad site as currently set up because we have shading. Again, you can see it on the, the fisheye lens from the, the, tr the surrounding tr trees that would eat up uh, 11 to about uh, 1230 uh, over the majority of the year there. So that, that one uh, tree would, would really impact the output from this, um, from this sample site. So we wanna make some, some adjustments to, to minimize that. Worst thing would be to invest in these systems and then have that not perform uh, as they're supposed to uh, based on these types of siting issues. So that was kind of a general overview. So let's briefly look at some uh, backyard aquaponic examples. And again, this really comes down to what are your goals? Uh, to reduce system energy requirements, uh, reduce energy costs, reduce reliance on grid-tied energy, increase use of renewable energy, offset grid-tied energy where possible, 
to become completely independent of the grid or to invest a specific amount of money toward a, a photovoltaic system. These are just some examples and I'm sure there's many more out there, uh, but each of these choices uh, would have uh, potentially have dramatic uh, uh, implications into what each uh, system might, might look like, the size of the system, the cost of the system, because these are very different goals. Uh, so understanding your goals is very important to figure out what would make most sense uh, to you, you know, to benefit your production system. So if we look at PV watts, and again, building off of the example that Christos gave for um, Petersburg, Virginia location, and the example that Bob gave uh, for sample load analysis, if we were to say, a smaller, the smaller greenhouse that, that Bob described, the load analysis was roughly 106 kilowatt hours per day. Uh, on an annual basis, that's about 38,000 kilowatt hours. What would a net metered system look like to try to meet nearly 100% of that energy? Now, just to clarify, you could have a system that was much, much smaller it does not need to meet 100% by any means. It could meet 2%, 5%, 20%. There are some policy limitations on how big it can be, uh, but it by no means needs to be this 100%. But just for reference, just to understand kind of the size of system we'd be talking about and really to emphasize the opportunities with reducing that uh, electrical load uh, through efficiency and conservation first, uh, we have this, this example here. So if we try to meet that over the course of a year using a net metered system, uh, we would have say a ground mounted array. Uh, it would be about a 27 kilowatt PV system. That's a pretty big system. Uh, and we would assume the tilt of the array would be equal to uh, Virginia latitude at that site. So say about 37 degrees. This system, according to the PV Watts tool, which you can play with online, uh, would generate about 37,000 uh, kilowatt hours over the course of a year and offset about 97%, almost all of the grid electrical usage at the site. Now, in rough costs, and we have uh, more information, this changes based on the size of the system, but just for, for a rough example, if we assume $2.75 per installed watt, the system cost would be about $74,000. That's one example. Now, if we look at the larger greenhouse, which had about 180 kilowatt hours per day electrical load, we can see that we would need about twice as big, uh, twice as big a PV system, so about a 47 kW PV system. Everything else would be, you know, the assumption would be the, the same for this very simple example. Uh, this would is projected to generate approximately 65,000 kilowatt hours per year, offset 99% of the electrical grid usage and if we assume that same installed cost per watt of 275 the total system cost would be close to $129,000. Now again emphasis on a net metered system by no means needs to offset nearly 100% of your energy usage but this is just to you know as a reference point on the, on the size of system that might be involved uh, to offset that and it could be a, a fraction of that uh, based on what your your actual objectives might be. Now for simplicity, just to understand how that relates to, okay, well, what if I wanted to go off-grid entirely? Now off-grid systems require energy storage and batteries. Off-grid solar array would need to be larger than the previous examples due to energy losses of converting and storing energy. And then also this issue of autonomy, because we're gonna build in capacity for when, it's, when the sun's not out. And that additional capacity is going to mean a larger system, a uh, larger system, more comp uh, additional components in terms of charge controllers, battery bank, things like that. Uh, so this would tend to be more costly as well. And we can, in the future, based on interest, we can kind of maybe do an additional session on any one of these examples or other examples that are more pertinent to what, uh, you know, what your interests are, what the questions might be. But just in broad strokes, these are some of the, the, the considerations. Alternatively, we have something we'll call solar assist. So basically this is something where perhaps certain aquaponic systems could utilize solar energy to offset grid tide electrical energy. 
and some examples here and that pumping system uh, so solar power DC pumping that only works when the solar resource permits and then the grid tied pump uh, is used during the other periods or you could have energy storage for nighttime applications but again increasing complexity and cost one challenge with these types of solar assist applications is sometimes you would need to purchase additional uh, DC powered equipment uh, not, not always and it depends on exactly what you have and what your objectives are uh, but that certainly could be a, an issue uh, depending on what you're what you're trying to do and the similar potential applications with ventilation with DC powered fans you know among other uh, a variety of, of potential solar assist type applications now we're about towards the end of our hour here so I want to highlight some additional resources uh, virtual grower a tool that Christos mentioned from USDA ARS. This is a very helpful tool to do a lot of what if type analysis with uh, greenhouse energy management. So I definitely encourage you to, uh, to check it out. There's some online tutorials, uh, YouTubes, things like that on how to use it, but a really great tool. Here's a video recorded with Dr. Both from Rutgers University, who's a greenhouse um, energy management uh, specialist and, and lighting as well. Uh, but he came to Virginia, did a workshop a few years back uh, down south side with us and was kind enough to let us record this session. So a great overview of some of the greenhouse uh, energy management uh, issues. I mentioned two videos that we put together that really dive into the fundamentals of photovoltaic systems uh, and then also one on solar hot water uh, applications. Uh, for heating or, or domestic hot water use, or in this case, potentially aquaponic applications. Uh, so I'd encourage you to check those out. There's links there. A project we're part of uh, with NIFA, Penn State, and other collaborators is called Energy Answers for the Beginning Farmer and Rancher. And a variety of short videos. Uh, there's a video, actually, this one's from Rutgers. Uh, How can I design an energy efficient hydroponic system? Uh, might be of interest. Uh, there's about a dozen videos and more coming. Here's one that we highlighted with some Virginia farmers. Uh, their experiences with participating in an incentive program with USDA Rural Development called REAP. Uh, REAP is a competitive grant program for on-farm energy efficiency and renewable energy systems uh, that is a, a mix of a grant program up to 25 percent of the project costs and a subsidized loan program. Uh, so that might be something you'd be of interest in taking a look at too. But anyhow, some videos highlighting some examples of things related to farm energy. And there's more at that link at the bottom of the screen there. Sometimes navigating the incentive programs can be a bit of a maze. Things are always changing. Uh, utilities offer certain things. Uh, sometimes uh, municipalities offer certain things. Uh, USDA certainly does. A great resource to kind of see what might be out there is this website. It's the Database for State uh, Incentives for Renewable Energy, uh, dsireusa.org, and you can sort by zip code and explore uh, some of the programs that might be of interest to you uh, based on your, your objectives and your location. And I think with that, uh, Dr. Neri, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, thank you again for the invitation here, and uh, we have time for maybe we have time for any questions. Yeah, thank you. I, all the all this stuff is always good information to digest and everything else. Uh, again, I want to apologize for the link. This uh, Zoom program is recorded. Uh, I would uh, suggest may check back in uh, four, five, six days. Uh, send me an email. Uh, to me at, uh, at uh, dcrosbyvsu.edu, and we'll try to get this uh, fully recorded uh, program to you, or at least the link to it. Uh, again, uh, we're coming to the end, and we should, uh, if you got any questions, please uh, ask while we're online here. Put your email in the chat box. Bob. Okay, thank you. Well, well, I'm not, I'm not really hearing any questions. 
let's thank all the uh, speakers for the job they've done today. And uh, always uh, solar application uh, for doing things like aquaponics and, and things like that is always fascinating. And a lot of folks are now trying to do this kind of stuff on their own. There's a lot of information out here, and I think some of the information we received today should focus our thoughts on how to really arrange a lot of this stuff in our backyards. So with that, uh, we probably have come to an end if there's not any questions. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody coming on. I especially thank uh, Mark uh, Klingman and Cynthia Gray for helping out. Uh, Bob and Christos and John, uh, again, thank you for uh, being with us today. Uh, maybe call on you soon again. Well, well, thank you all again. Thank you for the time and the invitation. And uh, please let us know how we can be of any help. Thank you very much.